North Korea. I mean, if, if it's just a cheap currency, you'd be very, very uh, rich. Nor would you rather be in North Korea or South Korea? <laughs> would you rather be in uh, old China or Hong Kong? Would you rather be in old China or Taiwan? You know, debasing the currency is, is would you rather be in Zimbabwe or South Africa? I mean, debasing your currency has never worked. Um, okay, just lastly then. Um, uh, this, is there anything that's going to stop this? So what you seem to be saying is that the economic problems that rich nations are facing at the moment are part of something more fundamental. It's, it's, it's real world economic rules popping back up to say hello and applying themselves instantly and there's a, sh there's a huge shift in power here that's, f that's fundamental rather than cyclical. But you said rich countries. The problem is how you define rich countries. Uh, what used to be rich countries, the UK, the US, etc. Yes, there is a major shift taking place. I mean, you've been around in Asia. Look around you. You see what's going on here. Go into an airport in Asia, then fly to JFK in New York. That's the JFK is the third world. I mean, look at America's infrastructure, then compare the infrastructure in Asia. I mean, the assets are in Asia now. And anybody who doesn't understand that, should they just get out some books and read some facts or visit Asia and see? I mean, I don't particularly like saying this. I'm an American citizen. I love the UK. But I can't live my life in denial. Otherwise, I'll go bankrupt too. And I'd just as soon not be bankrupt. I was poor once. I don't want to be poor again. I've done that. You think that's a sort of situation that many people in those countries, in the UK and the US, might have to think about? I mean, is the answer here, actually, there's not a great deal that Gordon Brown or President Obama can do? That there's a fundamental diminution of the living standards of people in the West going on that people aren't being honest about? Of course. I mean, look at the facts. The largest debtor nation in the world is the United States of America, and it's going deeper and deeper into debt every week, every month. I mean, th this is not my opinion. These mm. are simple facts. The UK is rapidly pricing it, getting itself so deep in debt, it's got a gigantic problem. Now, people can sit here and say, oh, it doesn't matter, the debt doesn't matter, or, don't worry, we'll make it up someday, we're the greatest country in the world. Say that all day long. But, you know, I, I was a student at Oxford in the 60s. I used to hear the British politicians say things like that. <laughs> you know, and then the next thing, it got worse and worse and worse. You may remember the 70s. Britain went bankrupt in the 1970s. It was not fun. But I heard people through the 50s and 60s in the UK say exactly the same words to no avail. They denied reality. Surely with America, the fact that it's reserved world, world reserve currency and it's been a safe haven even in the past few weeks, it seems, that's going to give it a lot of protection in terms of the amount of debt that they're running out. Well, yes, that's the only reason America's been able to get deeper and deeper into debt, because they can print the money. They are the world's reserve currency, although people are beginning to say, maybe I don't want to use dollars anymore. There's a gradual shift, just as there was with sterling uh, 50, 80 years ago. The gradual shift is taking place now. And how much longer the American dollar will be the uh, U.S. World, world, the world's reserve currency, the medium of exchange? I don't know. I know it's already coming under attack. and. Yes, America can print money right now. But eventually, if you print too much money, it just doesn't work. Nobody's ever succeeded at doing that. The UK tried it, France tried it, lots of countries have tried it. It's just never worked. Just, just on that w uh, one last point, it, w it seems as if Britain's about to start quantitative easing. It's going to start buying corporate bonds, this printing money. Surely that's a sensible strategy to try and pump the economy up at this type of time? Well, I sold all of my sterling uh, six months ago or so. I would suggest you might think about doing the same thing. I say, printing money has never, ever worked. Never in the history of the world. If they can show me one example where it's worked, I will kiss their feet. But it's never, ever worked. What they say is, oh, we'll print some money now. Don't worry, everything will be okay. You know, when it's time, we'll take the money back. So you're telling me that Gordon Brown in three years is going to, when there's inflation running everywhere, is going to say, all right, I'm going to take the money back and we're going to have a, a horrible recession? Have you ever seen any politician run on a platform, we're going to have a very bad recession? We're going to have hard times for a while. No, of course not. I'm not going to take it back. I mean, this, this is all gobbledygook. My, my problem is I've seen it too many times. I've heard politicians say the same things over and over and over again. 
we're looking at 2009, but I've heard it. You read some history. I read a lot of history. You, this is what politicians always say, always. The mayor of New York in the 1970s stood on the courthouse and said, we pay our bondholders before even the mayor gets paid. Two months later, the mayor was still getting paid. The bondholders weren't getting paid, and the city was, the city was bankrupt. I mean, this, politicians have been doing this for hundreds of years. So this is not just about economics anymore. The sort of shift you're talking about and the sort of economic, well, let's say it, collapse, is, is going to affect politics. And in some ways, I hear it a lot from China, they talk about this phrase social stability, but social stability in other countries too. Oh, yeah, you're already starting to see civil unrest. Look at Iceland, look at Latvia, look at Greece. I mean, we're talking about countries that are, well, that are reasonably well-developed in many cases. You're already starting to see social unrest in many countries, countries that we, would, we would consider prosperous or, or rich, as you used the term you used before. We're already starting to see it. Whenever we've had serious economic unrest, you've had civil unrest. I mean, we're going to have it again. I mean, and, there, and anybody who thinks we're not is just denying some kind of reality. I don't say all this with any great glee or pleasure or relish. I'm just telling you, you better be prepared. If you're not prepared, you're going to be one of the ones who's going to suffer badly. Okay, let's try and end things on a good note. Uh, <laughs> the, sure. um, um, well, let me tell you a good note. Yeah. A lot of people in Asia are going to be extremely successful. There are a lot of great opportunities coming up in the, in the period we're talking about. Farmers, for instance, farming is going to be one of the great uh, professions of the next 10 years. Farmers have been a horrible place to make a living for 30 years. They're about to make a lot of money. A lot of people have been suffering about to do extremely well. There were great fortunes made in the 1930s. There were great fortunes, the, the basis laid in the 1930s. There are going to be people who are going to come out of this wildly successful. I don't know who they are. If I knew who they were, I'd be investing in them myself right now. But I know that throughout history, we've had huge changes in, in the world. Some people prosper and some don't. Now, maybe you don't like being in television. May I suggest that you go and get a farming degree? Because farmers are going to be driving Lamborghinis in the next 10, 20, 30 years. The people in the city of London, all those stockbrokers, they're going to be driving taxis. The smart ones will learn how to drive tractors so that they can go to work for the smart farmers in the next generation. We've had things like this many times in history. You've had times when the money changers were making all the money, the money p paper changers. Then you've had periods when all of the people who produced real things were on top. Agriculture, mining, whatever it happened to be. We're in a shift now to people who produce real goods. So go get yourself a farming degree or, or learn how to drive a tractor, if nothing else, or move to Asia. I mean, there are plenty going to be fantastic opportunities magnificent opportunities in the next 20 or 30 years and some people will profit and some people will not.